Hey everybody, it's Frank Slauson here, and, and today I'm doing my first video interview. It's been a long time since I've done a video interview uh, with somebody actually face-to-face. -face. So, you know, I moved to Rapid City, South Dakota here about a little over a month ago, and while I was waiting for a job to happen, uh, I uh, helped my Uncle Scott uh, do some mowing jobs, and, and we actually mowed for the guy who I'm interviewing right now. Uh, kind of weird how we met, but we are talking about it. And talk about uh, who he is, and his name is Merritt Olson. And while that name might not be too familiar, how's it going? Yeah. <laughs> while his name might not be too familiar, but he uh, uh, has done a lot as an actor and as a, as a theater guy uh, here at Rapid City. Well, how you doing there, Merritt? Welcome to my little Thanks. video show. Thanks to be here. Yeah, and uh, it's kind of funny. We, we met uh, while I was helping my Uncle Scott mow your yard. And, and you were you were helping us that day, and you went and got some bags from a gro from the store anyway. And yeah. I would tell you about my uh, little show that I do or whatnot on YouTube, and then you told me that you were an actor. And I'm just like, wait a minute. <laughs> so I I looked well, I you used up. To be a... Used to be an actor, but I mean, like, still, I mean, I you know, how many people around that live in Rapid City here that are that have been actors? You know that that you know of. You know, uh, it's it's kind of funny because. Uh, uh, like where I'm from originally, Ned Beatty. You know, you've heard of Ned Beatty, sure. obviously. I, I took a class with Ned. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, Ned Beatty was uh, was teaching up at AFI, uh, which is the uh, the uh, American Film Institute. Okay. Uh, and uh, in uh, Hollywood, and uh, he was talking about how he auditioned for. Uh, different roles when he was first getting started before he had a name and he said well yeah. you know before I went into the theater I used to sell meat in a truck in Virginia's <laughs> West Virginia Virginia and Carolinas and he said and I'd drive around and I'd have to uh, talk these grocers into buying a whole bunch of meat and and uh, sometimes they didn't need any meat and I was really <laughs> desperate and I had to figure out a way to talk them into buying meat so I could come home at the end of the day and, and have a paycheck of some kind. Oh, yeah. So he said, you know, when you're auditioning or having a meeting over a role, he said, the way, what I always do is I try to figure out what it is that they, that you, if you're yeah. the, the casting director or the director, want, and I provide, I am that guy. You know, <laughs> it's like the old... Uh, Dustin Hoffman movie Tootsie. I, yeah. could, I could be tall, I could be short, you know, and he ended up uh, being in drag, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but he was a really nice guy. And is he from Minnesota? Really? Well, yeah, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, he, he's not from Minnesota. His wife, his latest wife that he married back in 1999, is from Carlston, Minnesota, which is only a town that's like 20 miles from where I'm originally from. Oh, okay. uh, and, uh, I don't know. I, uh, I got to interview him back in 2006, and I thought it was pretty pretty exciting yeah. to know that there's an actor living in the town. So when I found out that you were an actor and you tell me about this, I yeah. looked you up on Internet Movie Database. You know, found out how to spell your name and you know how to spell yeah. Olson. You know, because Olson can be spelled many different ways. You know, a couple of different ways anyway. And uh, yeah. yeah, I found you, and I found yeah. some of the stuff even other than just the movie Cujo that you were in. I found some TV shows that you were in, and I'm, you know, I'm just kind of blown away that you're here living in Rapid City. <laughs> yeah. well, but you yeah, live well, yeah, yeah. But I'm just kind of, <laughs> I'm just kind of trying to figure out the transition. Like, like if you had family over here, or or this is just a place you always wanted to live during the, you know, the yeah. golden years, or or well, how? When I left Los Angeles, I uh, I went back to a theater that I helped to start in. Uh, 1971. And it's a, called the Old Creamery Theater Company, and and it's in. Uh, when I came back, it was in the Amanas. When we started, it was in a town called Garrison, Iowa, 300 people. Oh. And uh, I was there you know, about three years, and then I uh, started looking around and uh, uh, interviewed for this job yep. uh, to manage the community theater, and this was in '92. And I was here managing the Black Hills Community Theater for eight years, and then 
my wife uh, and I moved to uh, Freddy Harbor, Washington, where I uh, managed another community theater, which was more like a performing arts center. It's yeah. an island, uh, base population, about 7,000 people. Oh. And uh, we were essentially the, the house for theater. We had two, two uh, theaters, a 75-seat theater and a 285-seat theater, and we yeah. did things year-round, and so, uh, but all this time, I've been in touch with people here in Rapid City about how things were going, because for eight years we were trying to get a new theater, uh, or, uh, or expand uh, the sure. place where we had been uh, housed, and um, there was a division between one group and another group, and so the community theater split off and were up in the mall for a number of years, and then finally this opportunity came along, but I've been coming through because my family and my wife's family is in Iowa, and that's on I-90 right oh, through Rapid, so we sure. stay with uh, a dear friend and his uh, wife, uh, and hear how things were going, and as I was approaching retirement, uh, it seemed like we had a great time in Rapids, so it seemed yeah. like this was a, a good place to, to land, and uh, it's been a real adventure getting this uh, getting this new Performing Arts Center started. Oh, sure. Yeah. So... Uh, so you're you're pretty much retired, or, or are you like I'm tired? You're tired, but you're yeah. just not retired yeah, yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you're still yeah, you're still working. So this is just something that you do. Okay. So this is. I don't know that I can ever fully retire. Okay. Okay. I don't know that anybody can uh, anymore. Uh, the way the economy is, but also they say you really have to stay active. So yeah. Oh yeah, I mean you might as well. I mean, you know, this is a different world we live in nowadays, as everybody keeps saying. You know, so. <laughs> but uh, so okay, so uh, so is this like connected to the school, or is this just something separate? Well, we it's connected in the sense that it was conceived as a joint venture. Yeah. Uh, it was sort of designed uh, together by the same architect. Uh, there is a partnership uh, with the school. Uh, but we have our own uh, focus. Uh, we are primarily active with the community in the afternoon and the evening uh -huh. with our classes and our rehearsals. The school, of course, is active during the day. So the magic hour is around 4 o'clock. At 4 o'clock, we have access to more of the building oh, than well, sure. uh, up to that point in time. Okay. Right now, students have just moved in. There's all, lots of issues with security. And, yeah, yeah. And so we're just trying to roll with uh, the changes that occur oh. almost on a daily basis. Oh, that's cool. Getting, getting it up to speed. So. Uh, yeah. Well, that's cool that you have a passion for the theater business because uh, just, you know, did you ever think that you would ever, like when you were a young guy or even even a little kid, ever thought that you were going to become what you have become, kind of? Like you know, get into I'm the acting business? Just, no, I was going to be a history teacher, uh, or uh, a lawyer or something like uh, that. I have a degree in political science. Huh. And in 19, December 1967, I developed a duodenal ulcer, and I was in, I had a, several transfusions and uh, some really cute nurses, but <laughs> it was a nursing school where I was, I was being treated. And um, the doctor came in, he said, you know, I got some bad news. Yeah. The bad news is, you're a, you know, you got a duodenal ulcer. You're gonna have to watch your diet. So uh. This will be a condition that you could have your whole life. And uh, but the good news is, you're not going to Vietnam. Yeah. Uh. So at that point, I realized that I really didn't want to go to law school. Yeah. Uh. And so I started looking around, thinking about what could I teach that would be fun. And I'd always loved the theater. Yeah. Uh. And we had a really good uh, drama teacher in high school. She was the same drama teacher for a film actress named Jean Sieber, who uh. was a quasi-famous actress. And uh, in my graduating class, uh, Mary Beth Hurt went on to do Broadway and films, the world oh, of sure. Woody Garp and all of that. Oh, yeah. And so, uh, you know, it was, it was a theater kind of uh, oh, yeah. uh, strong program. 
but I didn't really take it seriously. Yeah. And so at this point, driven by teaching, I, I went to graduate school thinking I was going to teach, and then I got into the performance side of it, and I never, I never really taught formally. Yeah. I taught in various. Uh, I, I did teach a little bit in college and some other places, but I didn't really. I wasn't into it in a full, as a full time deal. Oh and sure. Make a little money on the side, that, you know, in between <laughs> engagements, as we say. Yeah. <laughs> where I, 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 I went, finally after doing a lot of regional theater, um, you know, the Midwest and uh, New York and uh, Seattle. I finally moved down to Los Angeles because I thought that I would be able to make a fairly good living <coughs> doing voiceovers. Oh. When I was a kid, at the age of five, uh, my kin kindergarten in those, in those days was only half a day. Yeah. Uh, so I was in the morning section, and so in the afternoon, my mother told me to take a nap. Well, I, instead of taking a nap, I turned on the radio. We didn't have television. And um, I would listen to soap operas. Oh, yeah. And the first soap opera in the afternoon was something called Pepper Young. Hmm. And uh, I loved the sound of the voice of the guy that played Pepper Young. And it would go all the way through to one man's family at 5 o'clock. So years go by. And I'm taking my sister to audition for the Manhattan School of Music. And I'm sitting at the Cavicula Theater. And the Cavicula at that time had a lot of phones where actors could come in and make phone calls, call their agent. Sure. It was the, the days before cell phones. Oh, yeah. The service to get your messages. <laughs> so this guy is calling people and calling people. I'm sitting there because I had a call back for National Shakespeare Company, and I was going over the script that they were going to call me back for to read. And, uh, gosh, I hear this voice. And I just and when he gets done, I said, excuse me, sir, uh, but were you Pepper Young? Uh, on the Pepper Young radio show? And he said, well, yes, I was. And then I, and then I said, and then after that, um, did you do Jell-O? And well, yes, I did. <laughs> and, and, and then, uh, were you the voice of, of Smuckers? Well, yes, with a name like Smuckers. It has to be good. <laughs> and that guy's name was Mason Adams. Huh. And so I get to Los Angeles uh, to do... Primarily to do voiceovers so I could stay in the theater but make a lot of money, I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Voiceovers. And who do I go out as but Mason Adams? <laughs> Mason Adams sound alike. And that's kind of how I made my my living until I had to go on camera huh. and do television commercials and then, you know, TV shows and then huh. movies. But I thought I would be pretty much staying on the stage because I, yeah. as a kid, when I was in the theater, I always kind of hid behind. I always played old men. Yeah. Ever since I was, you know, fifteen, I was playing old men. But I was always hiding behind myself. It was like I didn't really want to reveal myself. And yeah. when you get to film and television, they don't care about what kind of dialect you can do, what kind of funny walk or mime or anything else. <laughs> they want to know who you are. And I didn't. Oh, wow. So I went into therapy yeah. to figure out who in the heck I was and, and that that could be enough for the camera. Once I got to that point and stopped acting, yeah. um, I started to work. And uh, so I actually had a career for about 10 years, but went through a divorce and yeah. just, just decided to change gears. And so I went back to the, old, to the theater to help start and on my way here to Rapid City and then <laughs> away and I'm back. So that's, sure. that's it in a nutshell. But it's community theater and is quite different than professional theater. Not in the sense of the quality of the work. Because yeah. I think there's some incredible actors and directors in community theater and some incredible shows. But in the sense that the people that are doing it are doing it out of the love of it. Yeah. And they all have to get up in the morning and go to their regular jobs and come back and do this with incredible passion on their on their own. And my father, who was in the recreation business, uh, and also a band director on the side, he had an orchestra oh, oh. for the town of and, 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 and a municipal band in Marshall. <laughs> I'm back in the recreation business. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not. It's 
it's not, you know, bouncing a, a volleyball around or yeah. a soccer ball, but it's people every night are having a great time through the social experience of putting together a project. It's like yeah. being on a team. And it, it becomes a family that kind of disintegrates at the end of the run, and then the next time they get together with another play, and maybe a few different people, it's another family forms. And it's it's really healthy, wonderful oh, yeah. uh, social activity. So I think it's uh, it's good for, for the individual, it's good for the community, the people support seeing your friends and neighbors up on stage taking the <laughs> risk and kind of walking that tightrope. And, yeah. You know, and it's, it's just, a, it's really a so really like, cool thing. So like when you uh, did commercials, kind of back to that, uh, that statement, uh, how many commercials did you actually do? That oh, people I would did, recognize, or I did quite a few. Um, <laughs> the longest running commercial for me was a Crispix commercial, oh. in which uh, I was an Iowa farmer, and the little boy comes up and he says, "Dad, which side is crispier, the corn side or the rice side?" And I said, "Son, of course it's the corn side, because we're from Iowa, <laughs> and I was from Iowa, yeah. and I didn't tell the director I was from Iowa." Until the shot was over. <laughs> oh, that's pretty. That's pretty interesting, though. I mean, and was this like uh, back in the seventies or eighties or in the eighties? Okay, I'll have to look that commercial up and see if I find you. You are you wearing like a farmer's hat or something, oh, like a farmer's outfit? On, I'm sure. Okay, yeah. okay. Something like that. Oh, that's cool, though. I mean, because uh, I didn't know this because your your uh, internet movie database page only said you know only talked about like your acting, like some of the movies and TV shows you were in. Didn't really say much about commercials or anything. So this is kind of new to me that you actually yeah. got to do some of that. Yeah. And of course, with voiceovers, you do you do a lot of voiceovers. Yeah. Things, oh yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's just cool just the fact that you that you've done that with your life because you know you could have been something else. You could have been you know. I could uh, have been a contender. <laughs> yes, you could have been. Uh, you could have been a factory worker. You could have been literally a farmer all your life. You could have been you know all the jobs that that normal people, quote unquote people, yeah. uh, do. Or abnormal or whatever, <laughs> but you chose the the entertainment route, and I, and I think that's that's great. That's why your yeah. story. Uh, that's why I wanted to interview you in the first place because I just I this is kind of my passion as well. You know, I, eventually I want to get into the entertainment business somehow, some way, and by talking to people who have experienced the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, and still have a story to tell, that inspires me. So that's well, it's a wonderful. Profession, as long as you know uh, when to change gears, when, uh-huh. to, when to say, hey, I've, I've gone about as far as I can go, I've given it a good shot, uh, yeah. and I'm not going to, uh, you know, there are other things I can do. I, yeah. there are, a lot of my friends in Los Angeles, working actors, but you have your good years and then you have your bad years. Sure. Your good years and your bad years. And um, it's really about managing money. And it... If you can, relatively young in life, grab that gold, what they call the gold ring, something, whether it's a series or a movie or a, a really well-known commercial that lifts you to the point that when you're going down, you're not going that far down. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You have enough money and when you're going up that you're leveling at a, at a, at a place that you can actually have. Oh, yeah. A life yeah. that you're doing. And so that's where the chance comes in. Yeah. For every time I went out to audition, there were 400 people that looked pretty much like me and sounded like me. And uh, I was up against the same people. They were my friends. We'd, we'd sometimes in, in a day go from one place to another in different cars, changing clothes for different auditions. Uh, and we'd see each other again and again and again and again the same day. And, uh, you know, some of those people just didn't get out when they uh-huh. probably sh- could do. Very bright people uh, just are, are staying in it and they're not terribly happy. Because <laughs> that, that level where they are is kind of here and they're doing the same thing over and over again. So how many people do you, uh, that you know that are, are still in the business to this day that are still oh, doing uh, it? Uh, quite a few, you know. Well, my wife gets uh, bored with me, but I'll 
I'll see somebody in a commercial or somebody playing a, uh, you know, a, what they call a day player has a, yeah. a modest role in a television show. Sure. And that's where they are. That's where they're happy. Oh. They're probably selling real estate on the side. <laughs> other things that keep going, but they, their passion for it, and I, I really admire that. I yeah. Just, I just like new challenges. I oh, sure. That. So... So you, I, it's, this has been—it's been good yeah. for me to have done it and do something else, and, and to know that what I'm doing now has value, and uh, you know, it—it—it's—it's—I've uh, uh, been able to make choices yeah. that go on the wire, which is is really nice. So, what are some notable uh, TV shows that uh, that you were in that people might not or might know or might not know? <laughs> well, let's see. I'm still getting. Residuals for MacGyver, Who's the Boss, um, um, St. Elsewhere is being shown in some parts of the world, don't ask me why. <laughs> um, L.A. Law is still being shown in places. Um, and you're just getting paid on the side for every yeah, time that you, you know, they show your episode? 65 cents, 33 cents. <laughs> it's like selling insurance. Oh, jeez. You know? It's just the gift that keeps on giving. I guess so. Uh, I guess so. You know, there's foreign distribution. Yeah. There's all kinds of cable channels that wow. specialize in oldies with goodies. And, sure. Uh, so, yeah, it's out there. Um, so when you see yourself on TV, if you ever do, you ever just wonder, like, uh, what would have happened if I would have just stuck with this? Instead of doing the theater, you ever wonder about that, or, or no? I think, in my estimation, I got out at the right time. I think I've been doing some of the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Um, but you get to a point where, you know, I was forty, forty-two when I left, and that's sure. that's about the time that you stop seeing guys at calls. And yeah. You start looking around, saying, "Hey, I've been doing this for fifteen, twenty years. I'm kind of making a living, but I haven't." Gotten to the big time yeah. in the sense of uh, you know being on a series, and, and being on a series would have helped a lot with my voiceover career too, yeah. because voice recognition um, is what causes people to buy product. If you uh. listen to any a radio or television commercial, most of those voices now are are stars, movie yeah. stars, TV stars that have taken over that market. When I moved to Los Angeles uh, the year before, or maybe two years before, Sir Lawrence Olivier did a Polaroid land camera oh. uh, uh, commercial, and it broke all kinds of barriers because film actors and television actors didn't do that. Yeah. They didn't do commercials at all. It was a, you know, it was a status thing not, not to do that. And so when I got there, I was already on the second team because I didn't have those uh, those creds. Uh, yeah. To begin with. So it's a different world now. There's so many different markets to reach people. Um, internet and and, and and cable shows and uh, it's all kind of gotten. Um, uh, I think it's democratized. Is yeah. the way to describe it. It's oh, sure. widely distributed. Huh. So. And also, as a voiceover talent, you can, you don't even need to go into a studio anymore. It used to be I would go into it, there was a studio on Hollywood Boulevard that I'd once in a while bump into Orson Welles in his wheelchair. Oh, wow. And, you know, everybody would come to these certain watering holes to, to do voiceover work. Yeah. Well, now, everyone has their own studio in their house. All you need is a, is a, a decent <laughs> microphone yeah. and you send it off. Uh, as an MP3 or whatever. Uh, don't even have to worry about traveling at all. You don't even get, need to get in the car. So it's completely different. That's what I like about my, my show because I, you know, I don't often do video interviews. I, I do more just phone phone interviews mm -hmm. most of the time yeah. because pretty much everybody that I talk to is farther away. Yeah. So it's very convenient that I can do all this just on a laptop, a microphone, and Skype. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, other than that, uh, well, the one other question that I was going to ask before I let you go is you were in the movie Cujo. Now, I have never seen that movie before. I've heard of it, but I've never seen it. But uh, you had a role as the professor. How did, did. How did that happen? 
Well, it, that is an, it, for me, it's an interesting story. I heard about this audition. I didn't hear about it through my agent, but I heard about it from another actor that they were going to be doing, uh, the, the, the Stephen King book was going to be turned into a movie. And uh, I'm not a Stephen King fan, but, I mean, I'm, I'm just not a, a big, big fan. I like yeah. Stephen King's work. But. So I went out and bought the book, and I read the book in one night, and it was clear to me that there was a role for me as this serial professor in the book. It's a more prominent role, obviously, yeah. than it is. So I walked in, to because I found out who the casting director was. Yeah. I walked in and I said, I know you haven't announced auditions for this, but I am sharp serial professor. <laughs> and she said, well, gee, Mara, thanks for coming in. I don't have any copy. I said, I've got copy. And in my back pocket, <laughs> I took out the book. Oh, jeez. And I said, can I just read? And I had it all marked out. Yeah. And I read it. And she, and she gave me a call back with the director and Oh wow! Got the part. When I when we did the the scene, uh, they we flew to uh, from Los Angeles to uh, to Utah to uh, you know uh, where the big Mormon Cathedral is. Okay. It was Salt Lake. Salt Lake City. And, okay. uh, we went up to the university up there and shot it. And three three days later, the director was fired. They brought in another director. <laughs> So my sequence was was uh, directed by one director, and most of the other footage was directed by Wes Craven. Oh, oh. But Wes Craven liked me enough, apparently, though I never had didn't meet him, that he started casting me in other oh. Wes Craven B movies, like oh, oh. Deadly Friend, and um, I think there was one other one I can't think of it right now, but you know. Yeah. Um, so. You never know. Yeah, the going to exactly. Out. Well, I'll tell you what, the merit. Uh, I appreciate the fact uh, you being on my show and everything, and you know this is a uh, this is a treat. <laughs> no, my pleasure. Appreciate it. And uh, anything else you want to say to no, anybody? Or? <laughs> just, if, if folks are in the area and they want to check out a beautiful new facility, come on over to uh, the Performing Arts Center. We're in Rep City High School, downtown Rep City, and we got some a great season of stuff for you. All right. Well, thanks a lot for being on the show, Barrett. And you take care. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.